Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm so excited. Um, and I wanted to let you know a couple things to start off, please. Silence your telephones that are in your pockets um, and refrain from staring at them during the thing, please. Yeah, thank you. And then also, I wanted to thank Elliott Bay Books who are supplying books, that pile of books over there. Do you guys like and love our independent bookstores? Yeah. These guys are wonderful. So you can support them and Hugo House by uh, buying books. Um, and a bit about the format. So the format of the evening is that Karen Russell will storm the stage in a minute, and then she will speak for a while, and then there will be a brief intermission, and during that you can get a drink back there or use the bathroom there, there and elsewhere. Um, and people will change the seating arrangement up here. Um, and then after the intermission, Karen will be joined on stage uh, by Diana Shin, who is a current Made at Hugo Fellow, um, which is a wonderful program. And if you don't know about it, I can't explain it all right now, but it's great. It's a year-long program for emerging writers um, that Hugo House provides. Her fiction has appeared in Gulf Coast Magazine, Pank, Alaska Quarterly Review, and elsewhere. And her essays have been named Narrative Magazine's Top Five Stories of 2015-16. And she's a contributing editor to our local uh, magazine, Moss Lit. So that's Diana. And, um, and I'm so excited that she'll be doing the Q&A tonight. Um, so Karen, whenever I teach Karen Russell's stories in creative writing classes, there's this electricity that takes the room. It's kind of subtle, but I just had this experience last week with my undergrads at the University of Washington, and it was familiar to me. But this class would mumble, this same class at the University of Washington, they usually they mumble quietly. I assign Lori Moore, who's great, but they just sort of mumble, or they sit there quietly and they don't speak. Um, these horrible silences take the room. And then I let off a discussion of St. Lucy's home for girls raised by wolves, and they're just beaming and their hands are up and they're like all ready to speak. And it was just so wonderful. And I was so grateful to Karen for writing the story. Um, there's something about her work that's electrifyingly inventive, but it's not just the sort of the wackiness and surreal quality of the stories. It's also her total devotion to the world of her work. She's intensely dedicated to the tiny, nuan tiny nuances of her writing, so exacting and generous with her reader, like she understands that writers are kind of asking a lot of their readers. And uh, the least we can do as writers for those readers in exchange for their time is be as relentlessly interesting and charming and inventive as we are capable. Anyway, before I get into the litany of awards and accolades, I wanted to mention that while this is sadly not always the case, Karen is as kind and generous a person as she is a writer. She's genuinely humble, I think, in a way that's hard to understand considering the litany that I'm about to tell you, um, but it's definitely genuine. Her emails, I'd read one, but it's not fair. But sometimes it'd take a while for her to respond, and I realized that the reason it took her a while to respond by email was that she was crafting these exacting and quirky emails full of excellent and lively prose. And I just thought, maybe you can phone it in sometimes, Karen, you know? <laughs> or, God forbid, that was her phoning it in. And if that's the case, I give up right now. Karen um, won a MacArthur Genius Grant when she was like maybe 31 years old. Uh, that same year, she was the only fiction writer to win. Um, her first novel, Swamplandia, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and was one of uh, the New York Times best 10 books of the year. And it won the New York Public Library's 2012 Young Lions Fiction Award. Karen was also a National Book Award Foundation 5 under 35 honoree when she was still in utero. She's a, she's a Guggenheim Fellow and won the Berlin Prize. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Granta, Best American Short Stories, and so on. Her stories have been collected in two incredible volumes, St. Lucy's Home for Girls Raised by Wolves and Vampires in the Lemon Grove. She lives in Portland, now, where she recently had a baby, who's here in Seattle, in fact, but is dissing her by chilling at the hotel room tonight and watching The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. <laughs> it's true. So please help me welcome Karen to the stage.
<laughs> so that's what he's doing. I've been texting. That's, I just had a moment of panic where I was like, how do I get on the stage? I hope this is the way. <laughs> it just seemed unlikely. So I'm so happy to be here with you guys. Peter, thank you for that introduction. Um, I love Peter Mountford and Hugo House, and this has been on my calendar uh, for a year now, I think. And I put it in my calendar. Uh, it says, do you go to Hugo House with your son? Multiple question marks. <laughs> um, so I don't even know what my credentials are. I obviously can't even imagine driving to Seattle with a baby. So I'm not sure why I'm talking about imagining, you know, alternate universes <laughs> that like tax my imagination. I was like, there's no 2017. And I, to be fair, a lot has happened this year that I think has um, felt sort of unimaginable. Um, so it's been, been a tough one for team fiction. Uh, but I, isn't that, how we were just talking, isn't that amazing that, you know, you sort of think that you're kind of a group of catastrophists with all these like dystopian imaginings and then you're like, oh, I was an optimist all along. I didn't know. My mistake, you've proven me an optimist, sir. Um, I'm just gonna set a timer. I, I think it's true that I had this baby sort of recently and I think this is so overstimulating for me. I was like, Peter, they're all so young. Um, uh, thank you guys for coming. I was also a little worried because suddenly uh, Portland and Seattle became these sunny paradisios. So I just sort of expected a bunch of albinos in here. I don't know, like no, nobody, <laughs> nobody coming. Um, so thank you guys for coming. Um, and to Hugo House again for having me. Uh, I wrote out a little talk, I brought slides, I, I brought pamphlets. I think this is just like a desperate attempt, uh, you know, for you to feel like you got your money's worth or whatever. And also to have things to look at that aren't my giant face. So feel free to look at your packets now or your phones, despite what Peter said. And I did write out this talk, but I always feel a little like, the Hall of the Presidents animatronic just reading. So I'm sure probably to my own detriment, I'll just ad lib too much. Um, but I, I wanted to talk tonight, um, I'm really no expert at any element of craft, but an editor once told me, and I think this is true, she said, writers each have a, their own individual pleasure. It's really idiosyncratic. And it's a strange thing, you know, to want to spend so much of your waking life with these imaginary people. So why do you do it? You know, why do you commit words to paper? And I think for me, it really is this kind of child joy of um, making a world, you know, making this little snow globe universe. And um, there's something uh, miraculous about that to me, that you can take these flat words on a page and then they become a dimensional reality inside another person. And as a kid, I really felt like the greatest intimacy I experienced and, and the most amazing living I did happened between pages, happened in these books, where really you could, you were suspended in a way that time didn't affect you, other people's demands didn't affect you. It was like a total privacy and you could have, have these experiences in places that didn't exist and also existed in the substrate between so many different minds, you know, different reading minds. So. Uh, I, I titled this an Engineering Impossible Architect. Oh, good. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I was like, where, <laughs> where is the slide going to be? Um, there it is. Uh, and I, I uh, used to think about, I would teach this to students, I don't know, like some years ago, the Kansas-Oz ratio, which is how I sort of was, it was taught to me as a graduate student, sort of what is the balance of terrestrial materials that you need to make an imaginary world feel real to a reader. Then, uncomfortably, I read Louise Erdrich's book, La Rose, which is amazing, but um, outs L. Frank Baum, or Baum, the Oz inventor, as like a, just a terrible person who was in favor of the extermination of the Indians. I mentioned that to you only because I found that out kind of recently, and this is still in the talk, but, uh, if you have ideas for another ratio, <laughs> you know, like the World War I Hobbit land ratio or something, let me know. Um, but, uh, but that's sort of what I wanted to kind of think about with you guys tonight, sort of what is it that makes so, an imaginary space so real that it is fantastical and so fantastical that it's real. Um, I also, you know, was sort of nervous about this event. And then I found this quote recently from Ann Carson. 
I'll just leave it up there. And you guys read it while I talk, and then, uh, and then just give me the benefit of the doubt here if things start to feel really associative. Oh, uh-oh. Uh, next, I guess the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> And then even the next one after that. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you guys read that. Just feel good about what you're hearing. All right. Um, so when I took my first creative writing class, I wrote many stillborn stories about matters pertaining to the real world. In quotes. Adultery and dinner party and zero dragons. If my favorite outfits as a young reader had been rabbit fur and jaundiced Frankenstein skin, now I wore nude pantyhose and sensible pumps. But paradoxically, the more I worked to portray this real world, to whip married adults into plausible dramas and describe the makes and models of their cars, the more these stories felt like a stiff, self-conscious ventriloquy of reality. These Raymond Carver wannabes were boring and grim and a betrayal of my actual emotional experience of the world. Flat cola stories, I came to think of them. I was trying so hard to get the facts right that my stories lacked any effervescent sense of creation, discovery, something bubbling out of the aquifer of memory. A favorite professor of mine turned me on to several wild authors, some of whom will be discussed later in this talk. Out of the dynamited materials of the everyday, these authors had engineered impossible architectures, escalators to the underworld, moon ladders. They extended my notion of what literature can be and do, and they gave me permission to write in twilight at midnight on islands in much weirder and blurrier seasons. I saw that these sort of genre-bending tales aren't mere kid stuff, not at all. They have an extraordinary power to draw out the deep strangeness of what we too often dismiss as the everyday. In philosophical investigations, you know, I'm not even sure how to pronounce this German's name. I'm going to go with Wittgenstein, but it doesn't look like that on the page, uh, right? <laughs> the aspect of things that are most important for us are hidden because of their simplicity and familiarity. One becomes unable to notice something because it is always before one's eyes. What I loved about these new writers was the way they gave me goggles with which to consider the known world. After observing how characters responded to the altered universes of Kafka and Kelly Link and Louise Erdrich and Kevin Brockmeyer, a transfigured traveling salesman beetled in his bed, a city where wounds emit light, I'd return to my own world with keener eyesight, a fresh appreciation for the mysterious properties of the ordinary. I put the book down and blink my way back into my bedroom as if for the first time. So none of this is meant as a knock on realist fiction if such a thing even exists. But let's just say for the purposes of this talk that you too are interested in engineering an impossible architecture in your fiction, a place that does not exist on any of our school globes or gas station atlases, a world like Ray Bradbury's Martian colonies or Italo Calvino's spiderweb cities. How does one begin? Um, I think the next slide. <laughs> So in her essay, Writing Short Stories, Flannery O'Connor says, and then, and then the next one, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fiction is an art that calls for the strictest attention to the real, whether the writer is writing a naturalistic story or a fantasy. I mean that we always begin with what is or what has an eminent possibility of truth about it. Even when one writes a fantasy, reality is the proper basis for it. A thing is fantastic because it is so real, so real that it is fantastic. I would even go so far as to say that a person writing a fantasy has to be even more strictly attentive to the concrete detail than someone writing in a naturalistic vein. Because the greater the story's strain on credulity, the more convincing the properties in it have to be. So that's the challenge, no matter what kind of fiction you're writing to convince the reader through the art of detail that the story you're telling is a true one. No matter how whacked out or otherworldly or fill in the blank your setting turns out to be, no reader will be able to live there long unless it feels solid enough to support a genuine emotional connection. Um, I think the next one, thank you. So 
Some of the most successful fantasies I've read take a matter-of-fact approach to even their strangest events. Characters don't protest too much through compulsive exposition or self-conscious explanation. In The Blinks, Kevin Brockmeyer's fabulous plague from the brief history of the dead. In Gregor Samsa's rebirth as that big bug in the metamorphosis. Uh, in The Scepter that floats placidly over the fields. In Chekhov's The Black Monk. All of these supernatural impossible occurrences are narrated in a naturalistic vein as if real. Which is to say they're presented to the reader with the same attention to detail as the story's more familiar elements. The grain of a wooden desk, the sound of frogs croaking, the red of sunset, a ghost and a pen nib are painted with the same deft brush strokes. Um, so in The Black Monk, which is one of my favorite stories, Kovrin describes a monk, a mirage that appears as a black dervish with the same steady tone and precise language that he uses for milk and mustaches and tree roots. The story details a vacation to the Russian countryside and not one of its events deviates from our expectations about the laws that govern reality until one scene about halfway in, Kovrin is standing in a wide field covered with young rye not yet in blossom, admiring a sunset, the evening glow, flaming in immensity and splendor. Suddenly, uh, I think the next slide. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, suddenly, a monk dressed in black with a gray head and black eyebrows comes floating toward him over the rye. Kovrin moves aside in the rye to make way for it, and only just has time to do so before the monk vanishes like smoke. All right, and the next one. Everything in this scene, from the unripe rye to the monk's black eyebrows, is related to the reader with the same vibrancy and precision through Kovrin's wondering eyes. And what's always impressed me is this weird detail where this guy moves out of the way of the monk. Um, that's the gesture that convinces me the monk has a definite, if uncanny, reality. Kovrin's involuntary reaction to a wondrous event gives the scene its eminent possibility of truth. Reader and character merge in this vertiginous moment because his reaction to the eerie manifestation is like our own. His fear and his surprise are made physically visible to us. The collision of one set of expectations and the black apparition is performed by a flinching body. Rooted in the rye fields, well grounded in the story's setting, we readers get to experience a certain kind of emotional physics in action. If the law of gravity seems to have been suspended to permit a levitating monk, the story registers that this is certainly out of the ordinary, a violation of the rules by which this world typically operates. Kovrin's very human reaction to the apparition, bewilderment, exhilaration, instinctive recoil, gives the phantasmagoric scene its meaning. A supernatural event told in the naturalistic vein becomes believable and affecting. Marianne Moore famously said that she thinks poets are literalists of the imagination and that a poem should be an imaginary garden with a real toad in it. So Kansas and Oz, or the better ratio that you guys are going to suggest to me after this reading, is my way to think about the vibrational feedback generated by juxtapos juxtaposing fantastic details uh, and realistic details in a story or novel. Unsettling echoes result from their interaction. These details can mutually confirm one another. So you have somebody like Gregor Samsa who's got bedposts and a chitinous exoskeleton and everything is kind of narrated in the same register. Uh, even as on another level their interplay causes the earth beneath the reader to tremble. It suggests that our whole idea of reality might be a slippery, glorious fiction. This is the central instability exploited by a writer of fantasy. If Oz is given solid life through concrete detail, then Kansas can begin to feel dreamlike and fragile. Certain bedrock truths that we take for granted in our everyday are loosened, spaded up, and re-examined. Um, so I always think of that in that story, there's a way where the black monk's presence casts its own new light on everything, on the rye fields, on the flaming sunset, uh, and sort of things that we take for granted come to seem fantastical, and something like, you know, a floating monk uh, can start to feel, you know, possible and familiar. Um, so before any of this exciting seismic stuff can happen, you've got a big challenge. How do you convince your reader to go along with you for the ride? Um, 
And I don't know if some of you are in a workshop or have been in a workshop, but some of the are get, you just start to repeat these cliches. And one is like, ground your reader in scene, ground your reader in scene, you know, or sort of where are we in space and time? Um, and it's not a bad question uh, when, you're, when you're sort of, I think there are sort of productive ambiguities and then there, there are ways where as a reader you want to feel like this person is the arbiter of the world that they're inviting me to and it's kind of safe to be here. You know, I'm, this is somebody who has a real understanding of the bedrock of this world that they're creating. Um, so what kind of grit, grain, and mortar from Kansas do you need to import into your Oz to establish it as a real place inside of your readers, somewhere they can inhabit along with your characters? How do you use concrete detail to earn the right to do something truly crazy on the page and have it believed? And I would say have it believed and also maybe have it matter to a reader, right? I mean, I think when I was a younger writer and still today with some disaster drafts, just read like bad anime, you know? It's just sort of like the rules kept changing. And so even if you believe, you know, okay, the ocean's in a box, who cares? You know, just, so it's sort of wanting, wanting readers to, to be able to create these worlds inside themselves out of language and also wanting them, you know, to go out on a limb here. I'm like wanting them to care about what happens in these places you're creating. Um, I think next slide. Thank you. I don't know. I was like very proud of myself to be able to cut and paste these images in here, but I... <laughs> There was another one I wanted to put up there where it was just like Sandra Bullock just kind of like floating, you know, in relation to nothing. Um, we wouldn't care much about, uh, you know, anything that we're reading on the page if there wasn't this umbilicus to a world or a nature that we recognize. I really believe, and I, th I can forget that even sometimes. It feels so fun to, to, to be able to use language to make these alternate spaces that... You, you could start to sometimes forget that everything exists in analogy to this world that we are living in. So even if you have, you know, your character's like a, like a cat on acid or something, there's got to be, by reference to the reality we occupy, a reason for your reader to care. And some, some kind of, something that feels consistent enough that, that we're, we feel that there's a solid world that we're living in. Um, and then I just, this next paragraph, I, I see that I've just written about my own like failure to date. Um, do you want to change the slide? <laughs> we'll get to it. So I, I spent a really long time in my 20s living in this like swamp of the mind for some reason. And um, I did so much research. I read these like very terribly written accounts of people getting bitten by mosquitoes in the 1800s and, you know, sort of um, depressing stuff about the Indian Wars and things that I had never known about this place that I grew up, uh, South Florida. Um, maybe, maybe change, change to the next one. This, that was a mangrove tunnel. Um, what I knew was that these spaces, physical spaces, had like a mythic resonance for me as a kid. Um, and that there was a way that the real history of this place um, felt so kind of hallucinatory and, and crazy at times. Uh, and I was just really interested in that, you know, kind of the myths that we were taught as history, and then the way that the real history started to feel sort of mythic. Um, and so, you know, you can see where the line between reality and fantasy begins to dilate and blur. Um, this is, you know, they sold uh, the swamp as this American Eden, you know, year-round growing season, and then farmers would be standing in six feet of water, sort of like, oh, <laughs> you know, uh, I think I fell for something. Um, and then I was, you know, researching this at a time when, like, all of, like, you know, all of Florida's hilariously named developments, you know, like ce Celebrity, Paradise, Orange, you know, Orange Eden were being foreclosed on, you know, just lots of algae in the swimming pools. Um, like the, the, so it was just like watching kind of, watching kind of this uh, fantasy getting sold as reality in a really concrete way happening in my state. Um, so I, I, I wanted to kind of like try to find a way to come at that and to use a fantastical approach to sort of help help myself, I guess, sort of contend with how these myths um, had altered the reality we were living in uh, at that time. Um, so I did, you know, and I wonder if some of you might be in the same boat, you can start to use research as a procrastination tool, like there's no end to the ways you can put off actually writing something. Uh, and the internet has just made that, um, you know, so everybody's search histories now, you know, I'd be like, what does a parrot think? Like, when, you know, who was the, Aussie, you know, who, the greatest Seminole chief? Just like a whole. Uh, ultimately, however, no amount of research is ever sufficient to bring a fictional world to life. 
that requires a deeper magic. Uh, do you want to, uh, I think the next one now. Um, so this is, I guess this is just an example of one of the overlays I started to like look for ways that the real world I was occupying ha was in conversation with legend and myth and um, other ways of understanding, more flexible ways of understanding reality. Maybe the next one. And then when I was in research mode and just sort of like putting off writing this novel for years, um, I just love this quote. The place looked wild and lonely. About three o'clock it seemed to get on Henry's nerves and we saw him crying. And he would not tell us why. He was just plain scared. Um, so something about the way history can feel science fictional. Uh, you know, this is this, this, this sort of monotonous, I don't know if you guys have been to the Everglades, it's beautiful, but it's also really scary, I think. There's like sublimity there, and then there's just the monotony of these mangroves and the sawgrass. And I loved the idea that it was right around three o'clock where this guy would hit a wall and start to sob, you know, <laughs> like, poor Henry. Um, uh, on their plume collecting expedition. Um, so I think if you're writing, like looking for places where things start to vibrate and shimmer a little bit, you know, looking for those porous spaces where the inner world and the outer world start to merge. Um, uh, I think the next one. So, I, so the thing is, I, yeah, I spent a ton of time and part of this talk, I think I've, I've been stressing, you know, you want to do research so that you have actual accurate information that you're importing into your imaginary place. I think I, I probably do too much, but it helps to feel like you can imagine with authority if you have a sense of the real world you're launching from. So I will give you an example. Um, yeah, one lesson I have to relearn continually is that writing fiction set in an alternate reality does not mean you get a free pass to do every crazy thing you want. If you're going to try a Kansas Oz shuffle, a radical rearrangement, you have, to ha uh, you have some additional responsibilities to the reader. One is that you don't get so tripped out on your godlike power, or more likely just exhausted and forgetful, that you violate the parameters of the world you've created. Many of my early stories failed to create a consistent rule. I don't know why I said early. All, many of my stories continue to fail to create a consistent rule-governed world in awe of sturdy emerald construction. They took place in frictionless worlds where I myself felt like a tourist with only a shallow sense of the laws and customs, places where anything was possible so there was no discernible center of gravity. I changed the rules as I went so the stakes were non-existent. It was not a world that had consistency so there was nothing, so nothing of consequence could happen there. Uh, and then you sort of discover readers don't care too much what happens after a certain point. We'll look in a second at an example from Kevin Brockmeyer's really beautiful novel, A Brief History of the Dead. And what always amazes me when I teach this novel, students will read the first chapter, which is gorgeous accounts of individuals' passage into the world of the dead. And they're like, hey, that was pretty. So now what, so who cares? You know, like what's gonna happen? They, they really still want, there's that hunger for, for things to matter to characters, you know, for something to be at risk, for there to be danger. I put that Tolkien quote on the packet too, um, just because it's true, right? If, if there's a fairy world where nothing is imperiled, where there is no danger, that feels false to all worlds. Um, I think I just paraphrased Tolkien badly, that feels dangerous. <laughs> it's on the packet. <laughs> um, uh, so as difficult as it is to get a reader to suspend disbelief, it's even harder to keep that disbelief lofted over the course of a story or novel as it progresses. In the same way that you can break a reader's heart by playing fast and loose with the rules of your imaginary world, you can also fail a reader by getting sloppy on the Kansas details. Um, so here's my own embarrassing cautionary tale. Uh, I, I got proofs back from my first novel. I was really excited. It was going to be a novel. I got these proofs. And the proofreader, I think, was horrified at how little I understood about just distances and time, uh, and just like the logistics of like our world. Uh, in one chapter, Ava, the female protagonist, hatches out a glowing red alligator in her reptile incubator in the Florida swamps. Um, 
And I think I had said this alligator was like, I don't know, something inches, you know, something impossible, like 46 inches long or something. And they're like, how did that thing fit in the egg? We have a lot of questions. Um, and it's amazing, you know, this is a novel that also like I wanted there to be good. There are sort of some impossible things happen, but what went through the, the, my early readers were these kinds of mistakes that revealed that I really wasn't in control of my own effects, you know? Um, so, and I mean, the fact that there's a red dragon hatching out, didn't borrow the copy editor? She's like, yeah, whatever, who cares? And it was just sort of like the logistics of like, could a creature that large fit in an egg? What did I really want people to picture? <laughs> like, um, and then I had, um, yeah, there was a 40 foot tall tree that was circled three times. Um, she attacked it with editorial lightning bolts. Her copy read, is this a joke or a mistake? Um, I just feel like that would be a good blurb, too. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Read and discover. <laughs> um, so the red dragon was okay, but I had to do a panicked, humiliated revision to the 40-foot tree. Because um, I had this kid falling out of the tree, and she was just like, oh, I'm still thinking my thoughts, alive, you know. Um, so I thought this was a good lesson about the danger of imprecision on the level of the line. Somehow a mutant strawberry red lizard was more plausible in the world I created than a child's 40-foot fall. <laughs> Why? <laughs> um, so I would just say, you know, this gator, you know, I tried to describe it by this kid in the same straightforward register she would use to describe an ice cream cone or her sister's hair color. To this kid, and hopefully to a generous reader, the alligator is a strange yet true entity. In contrast, this kid falls out of a tree. She doesn't call attention to her fall as miraculous. She doesn't check for a broken femur. She just sort of dusts off and goes on rambling about her sister. This detail, 40 foot, was a lazy mistake. Um, you know, and, and this, th I'm always learning this. You know, it's always interesting to me, the details that sort of like bounce a reader out of the world. I had some story when I was in graduate school about a minotaur that pulls his family to the west. And everyone was like, okay with that premise. Um, even though it sounds like a bad Saturday Night Live sketch, what bothered them was that there was like a game of baseball that they played, you know, and, that, and I understand why now. Um, because in this world that I was creating, that was a violation of these sort of parameters as I was setting them up. Um, you know, and like a kid can't call a f bleh, fall a fatal distance and there's no consequence. I mean, everybody is, everybody is rattled by that. Um, okay, next slide. So... <sighs> So I know that sounds a little obvious, but I think it, it, is, um, it is like a real demand if you're trying to write something crazy. And I love the way Flannery explains it. It's sort of the burden on you uh, is even greater in some ways than somebody who's writing a realist account of their childhood in Detroit. Because, you know, uh, Peter and I were just talking about the amazing novel, The Underground Railroad, which literalizes The Underground Railroad and imagines, you know, down to the studs what that might be like. Um, and the fantasy works as long as you have this feeling that there's a consciousness lofting it and really fully imagining it. I did this, um, this just gave me a new way to think about things and I wanted to share it with you. I'm not sure if it'll be helpful for you guys, but it's kind of shifted the way that I think about the physics of an imaginary world. I talked to these motor scientists at Hopkins for uh, a profile on uh, this kind of uh, video game they were doing for stroke patients. Uh, I promise this feels relevant to me anyways. They told me about the forgotten lineage of Disney animation called Wobble and Stretch. Um, and what they were trying to do for these stroke patients was uh, plunge them into a world where they had this motoric connection between the movements of their body and the movements of these cartoons. Um, and they bristled when I called them cartoons. Uh, Omar Ahmad at Hopkins told me, good graphics are not sufficient. It's the movement that we are interested in. It is movement that makes a world believable, the wobble and stretch, modeling physics, modeling forces. Conventional animation feels pasted in, he explained to me. It registers as phony to us, even if we can't articulate what's wrong. Action sequences repeat themselves, flipbook style, they unscroll against the green screen of an unreactive world. Whereas this dolphin that he'd programmed looked like a cartoon but had a skeleton, a xylophone of bones. When it moved through the water, there were consequences. Bubbles stream from its back, muscles sequentially contract, shadows rise with it, it breaks through webs of sunlight and lands with a splash. 
It's this springiness that authenticates the world to us. Every elastic interaction between character and setting, according to Omar, reestablishes the ocean as real to a viewer, a world with depths. So this really stayed with me, this idea that when you're writing fiction, what authenticates a world to readers, you know, I think it's easy to kind of default to understanding of setting as like, you know, the backdrop of those prom photos or whatever, you know, there's just like a palm tree back there and the real action is happening between the characters. Um, I think what was amazing to me was to think about the way that it's moving through this space, you know, there was that slide that said, when we read, we imagine that we see, but it's more than that, right? You imagine that you're moving through this space. You imagine that you're smelling this space. You, you are speaking to other characters. Expectations are, are colliding with different kinds of reality. Um, and that it's that friction that starts to make the world feel real. And, um, you know, I've been uh, discussing the concrete detail and its ability to pin down the reality of both Kansas and Oz for a reader. But I'd add that a person writing a fantasy must also be strictly attentive to emotional detail. I gave this example where I like miss the boat and have a kid fall out of a tree and no, nothing happens. Um, but you, you do need concrete detail to establish bricks and mortar reality of your alternate world, its fauna and truck stops and weather. But equally vital, I think, is the convincing emotional detail. You know, even if you're writing like a lizard man, like in Mrs. Caliban or something, that character has to have some kind of convincing, consistent inner life. Um, and like a convincing reaction to other characters and to their world for the space to start to feel real. Um, and the wobble and stretch, his idea was just, you remember those like freaky, freaky, terrifying Mickeys that just kind of like had these really exaggerated hyperbolic reactions to gravity? Um, that was what they were trying to recreate, sort of like cartoons that showed you that there were forces in the world that they were acting on and being acted upon. Um, so maybe the, next, maybe the next slide. I love this. This is Louise Erdrich talking a little bit about uh, lands landscape and the idea that you can't really impose a story and a plot on a place, but if you know it well enough and you think about the way that setting shapes characters and their desires and also thwarts those desires, you can start to see how geography might give you plot and give you character. And that's true, I think, if it is, I, I don't know why I keep using Detroit as like the realest real place <laughs> I can think of. Um, if it's Detroit or if it's Middle Earth, you know, these are places that are, um, the people are sort of geologic features of these landscapes. Um, I think, uh, yeah, maybe the next slide. This is from a book by this guy, Richard McGuire. It's beautiful, it's called Here. He decided to set the whole book in a one bedroom in his old house in New Jersey, and then he sort of leaps backward and forward in time. So you can sort of see the juxtapositions in these, uh, um, uh, the, these dancing girls from different eras. Um, they're more innocent than dancing girls. That sounds kind of louche. Uh, maybe the next slide. And then... Oh. Yeah, I just love that. So I was thinking, too, um, there's a quote a little later on about if you're making a world, another thing that authenticates it is time collapsed into that world, right? Is this distilled sense that there are many times in conversation um, inside the bobble of that world. Um, so sometimes the details that fully convince me of a twilight zone aren't descriptions of the setting itself, per se. They're details that reveal the private emotional worlds of the characters who occupy it. In Kevin Brockmeyer's The Brief History of the Dead, millions have been killed by a lethal virus unleashed by the Coca-Cola Coca -Cola company. That's weird. So there's a, there's a kind of terrestrial detail for you. Coca-Cola to confirm the fictive apocalyptic plague. All of the newly dead are reincarnated in a purgatorial zone they call the city, which looks a little like Main Street, USA. So this is a brilliant premise, and it's really kind of insane, but it becomes absolutely plausible as soon as you hear eyewitness testimony from these credible ghosts. And there, this is on your, uh, on your packet thing. Um, I'll just read a little bit from the beginning. When the blind man arrived in the city, he claimed that he had traveled across a desert of living sand. First he had died, he said, and then snap the desert. He told the story to everyone who would listen, bobbing his head to follow the sound of their footsteps. Showers of red grit fell from his beard. He said that the desert was barren, lonesome, and then it had hissed at him like a snake. 
He had walked for days and days until the dunes broke apart beneath his feet, surging up around him to lash at his face. Then everything went still and began to beat like a heart. The sound was as clear as any he had ever heard. It was only at that moment, he said, with a million arrow points of sand striking his skin, that he realized he was dead. The girl who liked to stand beneath the poplar tree in the park said she had died into an ocean the color of dried cherries. For a while, the water had carried her weight, she said, and she lay on her back, turning in meaningless circles, singing the choruses of the pop song she remembered. Then there was a drum of thunder, the clouds split open, the ball bearings began to pelt down around her, tens of thousands of them. She swallowed as many as she could, she said, stroking the crack trunk of the poplar tree. She didn't know why. She filled like a lead sack and sank slowly through layers of ocean. Shoals of fish brushed past her, their blue and yellow scales, the brightest thing in the water. And all around her, she heard that sound, the one that everybody heard, the regular pulsing of a giant heart. So and it's a great, it's a beautiful book. Um, I just, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about the blind man. I just think this is a really good example of some of the stuff we've been talking about. This chatty blind man claims to be newly dead and newly arrived from a desert of living sand. So you imagine this person like walking into the Starbucks. Um, what would kind of credential his account to you? His head bobs. Showers of red grit fall out of his beard. A fine shower of support for the blind man's story. But it's the snap that does it for me. His hunger to be listened to by anybody, everybody. His bobbing insistence. Gestures that feel so recognizably human that they confirm this blind man for me as a real person, someone so attentively observed by Brockmeyer that he becomes a character who is ensouled with testimony I can trust. Um, and I think we were talking about this wobble and stretch idea. The pleasure of reading somebody imagining so fully a woman swallowing ball bearings to sink through an ocean the color of dried cherries it's more, right, than just the visual. I think the dried cherries, the specificity of that, which is so weird, that's like a little pin that makes the whole world um, real to me. Uh, but omission is also an art, right? So I think when I was still to this day, you can, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm saying you have to, you know, give the GPS of every imaginary coordinate that you're coming up with. I think one of the things that makes this seem, this seem beautiful and true to me is this woman saying, I swallowed all those ball bearings. I don't know why. You know, omission is also an art and mystery can live in, in these worlds you're creating. Um, and just the, the idiosyncrasy of their passages is contrasted with the consistency of this heartbeat, right? There is something that everybody hears. And so there's this pulsing mystery inside of this story. It's not just sort of like gorgeous prose, um, you know, a gorgeous description of a bicycle or something. There's this, this real kind of thrombosis inside the piece. And I, I, when I read it, uh, still there's that suspense for me of sort of like, where are they traveling to? What is this heart that everybody hears? Um, a little later in the story, we meet the character Jeremy Fallon. Jeremy Fallon's 16 and from Park Falls, Wisconsin. So like even surnames sometimes can be little pins that specify a place, right? You tell me Park Falls, Wisconsin, and I kind of feel like, all right, I guess there's a Jeremy Fallon who's dead in this <laughs> antechamber. Um, Jeremy Fallon said the fighting hadn't spread from the coasts yet, but that the germs had, and he was living proof. Or not living, maybe, but still proof, he corrected himself. You can just see this kid's shit-eating grin, his wry self-correction. You can hear his desire to charm. That teenager against the backdrop of recent suffering. Um, it becomes all the more poignant when he explains the bad guys used to be Pakistan, then they were Argentina and Turkey, and after that he lost track. What do you want me to tell you, he asked. Mostly, I just miss my girlfriend. Her name was Tracy Tipton, and she did this thing with his earlobes and the notched edge of her front teeth that made his entire body go taut like a guitar string. All right, I mean, everybody, you know, if that's, if, I feel like that's the ante, you'll meet it, right? In this tiny capsule, you really see that kansas Oz ratio. You've got Park Falls, Wisconsin. You've got some sort of murky apocalyptic plague that has driven these souls into the city of the dead. But you also have Jeremy Fallon, his mock casual affect, and his sincere confession of longing. Um, 
these details. Strike me as exactly how a 16-year-old boy from Park Falls, Wisconsin would react to finding himself in the afterlife. Why should things make more sense in the afterlife? Why should any of our questions get answered there? How can we approach in language a loss so violent and extreme as the loss of everything? Against the scale of global apocalypse, everything he misses, everything he's lost, condenses to the tiniest of gestures of his girlfriend, that nibble on the earlobe. It is the heartbreaking human detail. It is the one that makes me willing to believe in this plague in the city of the dead. So to add my two cents to O'Connor's original advice for the person writing a fantasy, strict attention must also be paid to the inner weathers of your characters' lives. It's the characters' responses to their environment that will ultimately credential this, this, your setting for readers. No matter how foreign or strange your imaginary world may initially appear, it's the way your characters move through it. If that feels realistic, if your characters' speech and behavior and moods and terrors ring true, to what we know about both their personalities and human nature generally, then your readers are far more likely to accept the place on its own terms. Through each character's reactions to setting, important boundaries are erected. What is normal and what's abnormal in this alternate zone? You know, because you can sort of imagine some alternative metamorphosis where the guy wakes up and he's like, oh, it's Wednesday, this always happens, you know, what a bummer. Um, possible or impossible, cheering or heartbreaking. Where does the danger reside? What is there to fear in Middle Earth or Macondo? This is the wobble and stretch of consequence. Raise the stakes, writers frequently hear in workshops. In the case of an altered universe, I think this advice is particularly important because readers want a world with pleasures and dangers that mirror our own, even if it's a funhouse mirror. A world that's so real it's fantastic, characters with something to gain or lose, and a reason to care. So I don't want to prattle on and on, but I thought we could look just for a second at the, um, at the handout. <laughs> um, it's nice of you guys to let me give you a handout on a Friday evening. Thank you so much. Uh, this is, um, this is, I'll just do the very beginning of Annie Prue. Um, this isn't like a, the wild, it is a wild place, right? But it's not like Middle Earth, it's just Wyoming. Um, I shouldn't say just. So this is from one of my favorite stories, The Bunchgrass Edge of the World. The country appeared as empty ground, big sagebrush, rabbit brush, intricate sky, flocks of small birds like packs of cards thrown up in the air, and a faint track drifting down the red-walled horizon. Graves were unmarked, fallen house timbers and corrals burned up in old campfires. Nothing much but weather and distance, the distance punctuated once in a while by ranch gates, and to the north, the endless murmur and sun flash of semis rolling down the interstate. In this vague region, the Tuis ranched, Old Red, 96 years young, his son Aladdin. Aladdin's wife, Juanita, their boy, Tyler, object of Aladdin's hopes, the daughter, Shan, the family embarrassment, and Adeline. And here we've got Annie saying, landscape is geography, archaeology, astrophysics, agronomy, agriculture, the violent character of the atmosphere, climate, black squirrels and wild oats, folded rock bulldozers, jet trails and barbed wire, government lands, stream beds, it's politics, desert wildfire, introduced species, abandoned vehicles, roads, ghost towns, nuclear test grounds, swamps, a bakery shop, mine trailings, bridges, dead dogs. Landscape is rural, urban, suburban, semi-rural, small town village. It is outports and bedroom communities. It is a remote ranch. I think what was nice to me about that, you know, uh, high-low catalog, is sort of some of the really abstract things and then the very specific things that she includes. I think it helped me to start to think about setting as something that's dialogue, you know, or words on a menu, uh, or names like Aladdin. Uh, or the names of the grasses, right? Big sagebrush, rabbit, rabbit brush, or the idea of intricate sky. Um, and uh, I, other writers start from different places. I always start with setting. I think uh, that's one of the reasons I love this story, because the first thing that shows up is the country manifesting. And you just have this sense of that storyteller's authority. I really love flocks of small birds, like packs of cards thrown up in the air. I don't know. Annie Prue personally, but I just like to picture her, you know, with these birds like God's confetti that she's just throwing into her story. Um, 
And the thing that this, this paragraph does uh, is sets up a sense of the red walled horizon, right? So this is like a very open place that immediately feels claustrophobic to us and bounded. Um, and I just trust that she is the, the single arbiter of this world that she's creating. Um, and we get a sense of place, you know, graves were unmarked. All right, so humans aren't even able to make a dent really in all of this uh, openness weather and distance, um, and the distance that's punctuated only so often by ranch gates. And you can hear, um, it's, it's, it feels oppressive to me already in the sentence, to the north, the endless murmur and sun flash of these, these cars rolling down. So we're sort of drawing the outlines of the world. Uh, and the story is propelled by Adeline, the family embarrassment, this girl's desire for, for dudes, basically. There are not a lot of eligible bachelors uh, in this, quadrant of Wyoming. Um, and if you guys read just a little further down, what was there for Adeline when the work slacked off? Stare at indigo slants of hail 40 miles east, regard the tumbled clouds like mechanics rags, count out he loves me, he loves me not, in nervous lightning, crooked as branch wood through all corners of the sky. That summer the horses were always wet. It rained uncommonly, the southwest monsoon sweeping in. The shining horses stood out on the prairie, wither streaming, manes dripping, and one would suddenly set off a fan of droplets coming off its shoulders like a cape. Adeline and Aladdin wore slickers from morning coffee to good night yawn. Juanita watched the television weather while she ironed shirts and sheets. Old Red called it drip and dribble, stayed in his bed reading Zane Gray in large print editions. On the 4th of July, they sat together on the porch watching a distant storm pretending the thick, ruddy legs of lightning and thunder were fireworks. Adeline had seen most of what there was to see around her with nothing new in sight. Brilliant events burst open, not in the future, but in imagination. The room she shared with Sean was a room within a room. In the unshaded moonlight, her eyes shone oily white. The calfskin rug on the floor seemed to move, to hunch and crawl a fraction of an inch at a time. The dark frame of the mirror sank into the wall, a rectangular trench, from her bed, she saw the moon-bleached grain elevator and immeasurable range flecked with cows like small black seeds. She was no one but Adeline in that peppery, disturbing light that made her want everything there was to want. The raw loneliness then, the silences of the day, the longing flesh led her to press her mouth into the crook of her own hot elbow. She pinched and pummeled her fat flanks, rolled on the bed, twisted, went to the window a dozen times, Heels striking the floor until Old Red shouted in his pantry down below, what is it? You got a sailor in there? I, you know where you, you try make the mistake of trying to talk about things that you love in a, just the unspeakable place? I love this passage so much. I love it so much, and it's really one that's sort of like, uh, I've read it so many times, it is like the texture of memory for me now. And the reason that I think that's so is because you know, Annie has seen this place so clearly, down to the water droplets coming off the horse's skin. She knows what's usual and unusual, you know, and tells us about, I mean, I love that detail. That summer, the horses were always wet. All right, so there's a lot of time condensed and distilled, uh, you know, in like a six-word sentence. Um, the idea, like, and so how does that play out? What are the physics of this place? My parents were always wearing their rain slickers that summer. We were so desperate for entertainment, we pretended the lightning were fireworks. I lived in a room within a room, and it became, you know, that Alice in Wonderland, all of the expansions and contractions and the rhythmic escalation of desire in that section. So that even if this is, you know, nominally realism, it feels like you're reading about a poltergeist, right? It feels like this young woman is absolutely possessed by desire. And if you couldn't say for sure what the stakes are, um, you know, that, that we're not, it's not the kind of thing where it's like aliens are coming to destroy the ranch, you know, it's not that obvious, but you feel how unbearable something is becoming. And that's the, that's when I, when I guess when I'm talking about wobble and stretch in physics, that sort of um, gave me a new lens to read material like this. You know, the peppery, disturbing light that made her want everything to, that there is to want. Who knew that light could have that kind of consequence, right? Um, and the idea, you know, the calfskin rug on the floor seemed to move to hunch and crawl. Everything in her world is animated. Uh, so, uh, just, yikes, I've been talking for a long time. I think, 
I thought it would be sort of perverse to close, close this talk by looking at beginnings, sort of ways that people launch into these alternate spaces. I think we'll do the next, next slide now. Um, that's one way. Um, the fish slap to the face technique, or Dorothy, we're not in Kansas anymore. And I've talked about this already, but you know, this is the really famous one. When Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from troubled dreams, he found himself changed into a monstrous cockroach in his bed. I love the unapologetic strangeness of this first line. A friend of mine calls this the fish slap to the face technique. No effort is made to gradually acclimate the reader. There's no accommodation for our disbelief. We're thrown into the altered reality at the precise moment as Gregor. Um, we're right there with him, tap tapping his insect body. Practically, this is a wonderful strategy in terms of exposition and pacing. We learn the ropes with Gregor. Um, maybe the next, next slide and then the one after that. And then that bird. All right. Um, if you guys, on the handout, I don't think I have time to read it all, but I, I included sort of the beginning of this amazing section from Louise Erdrich's novel, La Rose. And what La Rose does is combine a really um, sort of like eidetic memory of a uh, historical space with, um, you know, very seamlessly moving into sort of other realms, spirit realms. Um, and she opens her piece, I'll just read the very first, outside an isolated Ojibwe count, country trading post in the year 1839, Mink continued the incessant racket. So there you are, just parachuted into scene. Mink, whoever that is, right, we don't know yet, continued the incessant racket. Um, but we all, we are anchored in space and time. We're like, okay, we're outside this country trading post in the year 1839. That's something you can do as a storyteller. Sometimes I think we can really emphasize the show don't tell, and you forget that actually you do have the power to locate, locate your reader that way before launching. She wanted trader's milk, rum, a mixture of raw distilled spirits, red pepper, and tobacco. You cannot get much more terrestrial and specific than that. Um, she had bawled and screeched her way to possession of a keg before. The noise paired at the trader's nerves, but McKinnon wouldn't beat her into silence. And we sort of like move from there. But um, being dropped into a scene, you know, trusting the reader to sort of hit the ground running with your character. Um, a lot of that, I think, comes from tonal consistency, too. Uh, you, you can really think about, um, in that case, sort of she, she's telling us in the very same register, a girl is like rubbing herself raw with snow, um, somebody, you know, somebody's covering up their ears with like a fox fur hat to block out the screaming, and also a pale being from another world is coming to save someone. And it's all happening in this sort of flat declarative way where the language isn't calling a lot of attention to itself, uh, and it's sort of specific and vague um, in ways that feel productive. Um, and maybe the next, maybe the next one. This is like, the tone is a little different here, but I think it has the same effect. This is from Calvino, uh, The Dinosaurs. It's like another favorite story. The causes of the rapid extinction of the dinosaur remain mysterious. The species had evolved and grown throughout the Triassic and the Jurassic, and for 150 million years, the dinosaur had been the undisputed master of the continents. Perhaps the species, when it's unable to adapt to the great changes of climate and vegetation, which took place in the Cretaceous, and by its end, all dinosaurs were dead. All except me, says that name I can't pronounce, <laughs> because for a certain period, I was also a dinosaur, about 50 million years, I'd say, and I don't regret it. If you were a dinosaur in those days, you were sure you were in the right, and you made everyone look up to you. So here we get a spectacular leap. We start with a dry epigraph from a science textbook and then whiplash fast. We're listening to the gregarious rant of Quifawifik, how do you say his name, whom I've always pictured as the dinosaur version of my boozy Italian uncle. <laughs> the matter of fact tone suggests that we readers can relax and let go of questions that might occur to one in another kind of story. You know, like how did he learn English and was Stephen Jay Gould right about the end of the Cretaceous, etc. The authority of his first-person voice and his storyteller's charisma gives us permission to go on reading with a similarly relaxed and joyful attitude. Calvino makes it clear he set his story so far outside the realm of possibility. There's no need to be troubled by logistical questions about the premise or just how exactly a prehistoric refugee could be stowed away in our century. And I said here, you know, consistency of tone, it's like a kind of ice that can hold a reader's disbelief at bay. 
Um, and it's shattered, right, when you do things like have a kid fall out of a 40-foot tree. Um, so I was excited to do this. I was like, oh, I can use my own writing as like negative examples, <laughs> and that will help, that will help the people. Um, do you want it? Maybe the next slide. This is, this is the wind down, I promise. Uh, this is, I know I, I sort of talked about this earlier, omission is also an art. I think this is one of my favorite sentences in the language. Uh, this is Kevin Brockmeyer again, and this, these are the people sort of like, you know, going through the swinging doors into the world of the dead. Graziella Cavazos would say only that she began to snow four words and smile bashfully when anyone pressed her for details. Um, and I think sort of the dinosaurs, some, something about the dinosaur being like, I don't have to tell you guys all the details. That seemed nice to remember too. That another, another thing that can make a world feel true is that there's mystery inside it. You actually, as the writer, don't have to know everything. Um, you know, I think there's a way where these kinds of omissions um, sync so beautifully with what, a, with what a reader doesn't know. It's just a way to acknowledge what's mysterious about a world. And as long as you acknowledge it, it feels like you're kind of in control of that space and aware of it too. But also it's just, just feels beautiful and human that, you know, why did she swallow all those ball bearings? Sometimes you don't know why. You're just floating in a ocean that looks like dried cherries, um, seized by a weird impulse. Uh, so maybe the, the next slide. And I really love this. I think this is just a more, a lovelier way of saying what I've been trying to say, which is thinking about how you are going to set up the rules of your world, what the boundaries are, what the dangers are, what people desperately want, what they can't get. Um, yeah, thank you. No, I think the bird is good. If you guys have read this, it just says, if a piece of prose aspires to art, it must close itself off setting in motion sympathetic vibrations and gaining as with any enclosure resonance. And um, I had just like a little last, last deal I'll read. Uh, so I'll close with a question some of you writers might have already had to field from concerned loved ones. Why spend so much energy to create an imaginary place? And if you're the reader of fantasies, what's the value in spending a chunk of your life in a place that doesn't exist? I speak as a person who has several male relations who refuse on principle to read fiction. Uh, their rationale goes something like this. What truth can I learn from some whoppers told by a damn elf? <laughs> Historical fiction occasionally gets a grudging past because at least it teaches one about customs. <laughs> I like to direct them to an interview with George Saunders um, in which he's asked, uh, I'm interested in the trace fantastical elements that appear in your stories as well as the occasional ghost. So many of them seem wedded to an emotional realism, yet your settings, the landscapes, are often, if not fantastical, exceedingly odd or improbable, leading to real emotions in an unreal world. And your stories sometimes very slightly leave the realm of physical possibility entirely, the dead awaken, for instance. Do you see a difference between realism and fantastical writing? To which Saunders replies, realism is nonsense when you think of it. I mean, there is no such thing. Nobody writes realism if realism is defined as fiction that is objective and real and not distorted, but is, you know, just normal. The nature of all fiction is distortion, exaggeration, and compression, and what I find exciting is the idea that no work of fiction will ever, ever come close to documenting life. So then the purpose of it must be otherwise. Okay, but what is the purpose then? <laughs> the interview just kind of cuts out. Um, uh, and here's O'Connor again, I think, preaching to our choir. The truth is not distorted here, she reminds us, but a distortion is used to get at truth. We return from these imaginary worlds with a renewed sense of wonder, with an altered understanding of our lives and bodies and boundaries, and with a looser relationship, perhaps, to that undulating set of memories and perceptions and sensations, the engulfing sum of everyday reality. As Shirley Jackson, another engineer of impossible architectures, writes, as she opens a door onto infinite corridors in the haunting of Hill House, no live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. That's it. Thanks, guys.
Attending Scribes last summer was one of the best decisions I've ever made. I had been writing for years, but very rarely showed my work to anyone else. I was, and remain, a private person, especially about my writing. So just applying to Scribes was a big step for me. But after my first day with Hugo House, they had won me over completely. I felt immediately welcome, and I think the instructors were a big part of that, because they weren't just instructors, they were participants as well. Their approach was to teach from the inside out, leading by example and never relying on artificial authority. They weren't above us, they were right there with us, always engaged. The environment Hugo House created at Scribes fostered learning effortlessly. I'd never met like-minded people my age before, people who enjoyed building and deconstructing stories as much as I did. Never before had I felt so energized. Ideas were free-flowing, and even idle chatter felt productive. It was intoxicating. After those two weeks, I was hooked. I had no choice but to join the Young Writers Cohort, and now our meetings and open mics have been the highlight of my week for almost a year. I'm proud of the skills I've learned from workshop after workshop, but to me, the most valuable thing Hugo House gave me is a sense of belonging, of community. Writers have a tendency to isolate themselves. Hugo House brings them together. With that said, Hugo House is a non-profit organization, so we really do depend on your donations to survive. Everything from the very big to the very small, it makes a big difference. Um, and I might I suggest if you're the kind of person who likes to put dates on their calendars, you might mark down May 10th. It is the, I believe, the seventh annual Give Big event, extravaganza, whatever you want to call it. It's a cool day of philanthropy and giving, and you should get in on it. That's great. Um, you should just Google it. Google knows more about it than I do. So thank you for bearing with me on that. I will now reward you with a silly poem I wrote about soup to make fun of people who are maybe a little too angsty. With some of my peers. I present teaching them how to brood. <clears throat> For best effect, please imagine I am wearing all black, I have a lot of eyeliner on, and maybe a beret. You are eating soup alone again. There is nothing wrong with eating soup alone. You like eating soup alone. You ate soup for lunch every day for a week. It was delicious on Monday, but you were sick of it by Thursday. You made the soup yourself. Somehow, that makes it more lonely. You wish someone would make something for you, or that you would make something for them, but you don't, and they don't, so you eat soup alone again. And that's all right. There's nothing wrong with eating soup alone, but it can be rather lonely. On Monday and Tuesday, you had rosemary bread. You downgraded to a stale baguette on Wednesday. It is Thursday, and you have crackers. Ritz crackers to go with your curry soup, which you are eating alone. You wish you had the stale baguette. You wish you had the rosemary bread, but you don't. You have Ritz crackers. In the kitchen, or the canteen, or the cafeteria, wherever people gather to eat, you are eating soup alone again. But there are other people, people who are not eating soup, people who are not alone, but they pretend they are anyway. They play melodramatic music out of phone speakers. They talk about how hard their lives are as white kids attending a private school in the greater Seattle area. Not that they don't have problems, Puberty is hard, but not really that hard, like wood. So you resolve to teach them how to brood. Your actions are deliberate, but not dramatic. You pace and pump the handle of the paper towel dispenser and rip a length of paper towel off. You pace and pour your soup from a repurposed yogurt container into a bowl, put the bowl into the microwave. You don't even like yogurt. Set the microwave for one minute and 30 seconds. Avoid eye contact. Listen. Pace. Open the microwave. Stir the soup. Close the microwave. Set the microwave for one minute and 30 seconds. Play with your center of gravity. Shift your weight. Sway on the balls of your feet. 
Take the soup out of the microwave. Transport the hot bowl onto the table with paper towel oven mitts. Sit down. Pass judgment on their music. Say nothing. Unscrew the cap of your hot sauce. Stir the hot sauce into the soup. Peel the wrapping off your Ritz crackers. Pause. Look disappointed. Straighten your posture. Pull your chair in. Hear the chair legs scrape across the linoleum floor. Maybe someone will notice you if you sit straight enough, if your chair is close enough, if you scrape loud enough. But they don't, or you don't. So you face your soup again, and your Ritz crackers alone, and you eat, and you feel lonely, and the soup is bland. You ate it one too many times. You didn't use enough hot sauce. Nobody notices you. Your master class in brooding goes unappreciated. Your lessons go unlearned. So, to prove that you don't care, that you are above and beyond such things as adolescent angst, you clean up your soup, wash your hands, walk out the door, and write a poem about it. Thank you. Hi, Diana. <laughs> soup is such a lonely word. <laughs> um, I saw someone eating soup in the movie theater recently. Isn't that? He just like opened up a Tupperware. Oh, and right. I went he from feeling, he just brought in soup. It seems so bold. <laughs> I've smuggled in, you know, all other foods, but not soup. Yeah. Um, oh, I think I heard someone who smug uh, smuggled in fried chicken once, so. More bold. Yeah, he's in good, in good company. Well, thank you for your talk. I wish I had heard it years ago, I think it might have saved me from my harshest workshop. <laughs> um, does the sound okay? Great, so since you mentioned you start, always start with setting, I thought I would start with setting as well. Um, I love what you've said about uncanny landscapes like swamps and ice flows that are there, bland, but not maybe not land, and you never, they're so unstable. I'm just wondering if there's anything that's drawn you in the Northwest, an uncanny landscape or uncanny spaces? Yeah, I think um, that, yeah, that's the kind of unsophisticated thinker I am too, where I'm always just looking for like metaphors to inhabit or something. <laughs> um, and I, in Florida, you know, it's just like the big uncanny, the, you're living in it. It's just sort of, and I, I think I found the only swamp uh, in Portland. It's this, uh, <laughs> that's where we live now. We live like next to, it's called Oaks Bottom Creek. Um, it's not a sanctuary, it's a place for birds. So I don't know if we're trying to like, <laughs> maybe sign a petition so we can be a sanctuary. Right now it's just a place birds could go. Um, but it's like a wetland that's sort of right mm -hmm. near the, it's, and it's uh, beautiful. And that feels to me sort of like, yeah, like childhood landscape, like something that um, is always kind of slipping between spaces. But I also thought, you know, um, Mount Hood or mountains generally, um, that kind of snow in July feeling, right? Or just sort of the way that yeah. I'm still getting used to, there are just days where the mountain is visible and days where it's not, and it just feels uncomfortably close to senility to me. <laughs> like it just sort of <laughs> remembers it it's not? a mountain, yeah. and then it's like, oh, I don't know. It's like, oh, I'm a mountain. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. that seems kind of uncanny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's also a place in Butte, apparently, where birds like have flown there, but then they like die because it's Butte and there's a lot of mining pollution. Oh, no. Yeah. But speaking of like strange spaces and also places where the past kind of comes back to haunt the present there too. Yeah. Yeah. But you, well, but that, is, I just feel like increasingly nature's like, okay, it's true. We don't speak English, but how can we make this clear? <laughs> like, oh yeah. <laughs> like all of the, there's a problem here guys. All of the like, yeah, white, you know, just like bony middle finger, of the like bleach out coral reef and stuff mm -hmm. where they're like, it's true, we don't speak your language, but I think we've been clear. <laughs> like, birds up, you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and so speaking of childhood and stuff too, like the childhood setting, there's a lot said about Swamplandia coming out of growing up in Florida, but you go to so many new places in your more recent work, you know, we're in Meiji era, Japan, and we're in Antarctica. And I'm just, um, how does that shift like the story for you and also, what kind of research do you have to do to bring in those details or to have the authority to go into those places? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I didn't mention her, but um, someone who's sort of seen as a staunch realist, Alice Monroe, amazing writer. And I think she's someone who 
a lot of her writing life has been spent in Nova Scotia, right? And it just, you know, this is, that is the world that she knows to bedrock. Um, I guess for me, it was such a struggle to write that novel that I think I was like, gotta get out of Florida or I'll die. <laughs> you know, like it just really felt like, and I mean, it just seemed to somehow sync with like my experiences as a kid on road trips where I was like, how are we still in this state? We've been in the car for three weeks. <laughs> like, <laughs> when will we get out of this state? Um, so I think it felt like important to me to try to kind of move out mm -hmm. Im imaginatively. And now it starts to feel a little like, oh, maybe it's safe to return to visit every so often. But I did feel, <laughs> especially with, you know, you mentioned this story set in Japan. And I think I was talking a little bit about kind of overdoing research. Um, you know, I've never been there. Uh, and as a way to both kind of procrastinate, but also feel like I had the authority to do anything imaginatively, um, I just read a lot about, I just nerded out on this uh, area. Um, read sort of the sociologist account of factory workers um, in the mm -hmm. Meiji era. So, so things that, I mean, I know there are other writers, I should mention this just in case people are bold. There's Jim Crace is somebody who I love, who does no research. Uh, and or or just or lies about that, <laughs> or does a lot of research and then lies. Um, more, so, one of the two. <laughs> yeah, it's always really impressive when I hear about other people's research and they're digging through yeah. these letters and accounts from the past, and it just seems like the historical voices are coming back into the present, and then yeah. you're just balancing these two worlds in your own writing too. I know. Wouldn't it be nice if someone was just like Wikipedia? That's what I use. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I spent an embarrassing amount of time on yeah. Wikipedia already. Yeah, a cursory, yeah. a cursory glance at Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just... Or I do also have to like ask people about physics a lot, like mm -hmm. you know, how far can you fall, or what would something look yeah, like? Yeah, that distance? was one of my favorite parts of writing so Lady was calling like my elderly father <laughs> and asking him how far he thought a love besotted possessed teenager could carry a boat engine. And he was like, well, I don't know. Like, he was like, tell me, like, how big is she? Is she a big girl? <laughs> it was a really good conversation. I was like, I don't know. She's possessed by a demon that she loves. He's like, all right, well, <laughs> that slightly changes things, you know, but it's still sort of. Um, so having fact checkers that you can consult yeah. is always good. Um, so kind of going on to the teenage angst topic, too, um, sometimes when I read your writing, I think of this Rilke quote, um, and it's in letters to a young poet, but he's writing to the student poet, and he's, you know, being really thoughtful and contemplative, and then suddenly, I don't know where he writes, and the adults are nothing, and, <laughs> you know, and their dignity has no value. I think of that as an anthem in your writing sometimes, too, because even when you write about adult characters, um, you have this, like, resistance to the grown-up stuffiness or the adult norm. Yeah. And I just, um, so is there like a, a certain teenage impudence that draws you to those characters? And as you move away into adult characters too, like are there shifts and limitations in what the story can be? Oh, that's a great question. I think that's a really great question because I do think um, so much of my writing life to date has really been interested in adolescence for whatever reason. I also really like, it's true, Rilke will do those mic drops, right? Where yeah. he's like, <laughs> you're just like, yeah, sharing a moment where he's like, you must change your life. And you're like, oh, all right, thank you. No I know, did. yeah, even, yeah, he'll get you, <laughs> even like when you're not reading it <laughs> because you're confused or lost. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, let me think about that for a second. It is really, you know, I just really feel like there's some kind of, something analogous to jet lag where whatever experience I'm writing out of, it's never the present one. I think this happens to a lot of people, right? But what I just found when I was in my 20s, I wanted to write about childhood, probably because it felt like I could see it in the rear view now. I don't know what I'm touching. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and then, and it's just creeping forward. You know, I would write like a protagonist. I was like, I'm gonna do an adult protagonist. I'm done with these 13 year olds. And it would be just like, you know, a million-year-old vampire who also sounded like a teenager. So it's just been a slow... <laughs> Maybe, like, as a teenager, you discover process. the problems and, like, the issues that you have that you're going to carry with you I for the rest of your think life. I that's it. You know, I do really think there's something to that, that those preoccupations mm -hmm. stay with you. And I, I, that's been dispiriting to me as I, you know, use oil of oil moisturizer and continue to age, but discover none of the answers that I anticipated having at this late <laughs> hour have come to me. Like, it's not, like, the questions you have when you're sick 
I'm going to say some of those are still open, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Um, you know, the, the way you can articulate them changes, but it's not, um, you know, it does. So, yeah, that way. Yeah, I think Rilke might be onto something there. <laughs> um, and I just feel, it's still, I just still feel, you know, like 14 on some level. Every kind of new milestone, I feel a little bit betrayed that the others aren't like screaming in the streets, you know? Like, childbirth was a little bit like that, I'm going to say. I'm like, wait a second, why aren't we all screaming most of the time? <laughs> like, this just seems like a wild way for a new face to come into the world. Mm -hmm. um, so... That's a very roundabout answer to the question, but I do, I think it's been interesting and it's incremental, right? So I'll write a character now who's like 22 and feel like, wow, I'm really getting out of the morass of adolescence. <laughs> so I'll be like 101 and I'll write like a 30 year old. I don't know. Mm -hmm. well, the other thing about your teenage characters too is that sometimes they're part wolf or part silkworm. And that's always been interesting to me. It's like a very difficult Kafka territory and you have to think about the internal architecture or how emotions and physical movements might change yeah. too. But also does it offer you to go more places or to, you know, what does it, where does it allow you to go? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. With this story, so I wrote this story set in Meiji era Japan with these women who are sort of literally and physically turned into silkworms. Um, and I think you could have written that story. There's another, uh, yeah, again, more sophisticated, or different kind of writer who would be able to talk about the nightmare of that historical reality in a, just in a straightforward, realist way. Um, but I think something about literalizing it and making it so extreme, there's a way that I felt like, okay, now I have permission to really inhabit this space. I think I felt sort of shut out. I mean, that's just been how it, hmm. that's just how the ride's been for me. If something, a sort of really straightforward um, fiction, I get panicked. I feel like I'm in fluorescent lighting. I have to get everything right. And doing these sort of dilations, it lets me feel like I can enter that space and maybe plug into something that feels emotionally true to me that I just can't access the other way. And mm -hmm. that's, I think that's gotta be as freakish an individual as like any person's fingerprint, you know? Um, but I don't really know how to plug into the things that give a story life sort of in just like a, if, if I was just setting it in, um, in Japan, you know, in Japan, mm -hmm. you know, in a Japan where women were working, tithing all of their daylight to these factories, you know, it had to become sort of this really extreme dilation. And then I still felt like, well, this is realist in the sense that I think that these emotions are probably, you know, or I hope that this reads as um, true to what people know about mm -hmm. the seismic metamorphosis, you know, of like sort of global and local that's happening. Um, but yeah, I just, I've, and that's always, and, and then there's like this pleasure that I think is difficult to talk about, about writing an alternate space, you know? I mm -hmm. think that's a, the unreality of fiction is something that I don't think people always exploit. Um, so I hope it, I didn't make it sound like, oh, you have to do, you know, a doctorate in whatever world you're creating to, to start to write about that place. The privilege of imagining a place that could not exist is a huge one. Um, so. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I just glanced at my clock to, or my watch too, and I wanted to open it up for audience questions as well. So, um, if you do have questions, you can raise your hand. I'll try to translate. Or there's also a handy microphone up here as well. Um, looks like there's some people in the back. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a real tough challenge, right? Because you don't want something that just feels like a slippery phantasmagoria with no walls or something, right? Or I think that's the way that hearing a friend describe their dream is pretty boring. <laughs> Where you're like, oh wow, like people eating land eels and then your aunt came, oh my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> weird. <laughs> Maybe meaningful, maybe neurons firing. You know, I think that is a real good question. Um, I always kind of think that other characters in a story can sort of, you know, mirror back 
a reality that, that it, you know, I'm, the, one of the stories we're going to talk about in this class tomorrow is Victor Laval's um, really incredible story about a man in the Bronx with mental illness. And so the check there is just other people's reactions to the things that this first person narrator assumes as true. So there are mirrors inside the story that are letting you know kind of, okay, you know, we're, we're eating the same food and you're having a delusion, you know? So I think uh, having some character who can sort of mirror back objective reality is helpful. Um, uh, like a foil or some other way to have, like check the reliability, I guess. Yeah. yeah, and I also think that's a good question too, even for things like, I wonder if you ran into this in a workshop, sometimes you get something that was just like blindly misogynist or, or, bl or, bl or blind about some other aspect, you know, and it's, I think that you can have, um, and then the defense would always be like, well, he's a very sexist character. And you'd be like, yes, but the world is pervaded by a hatred of women. <laughs> how, to, how to correct for this, you know? So there are ways to sort of use, subtly use other characters' reactions, even like in dialogue or something, to kind of push back on one character's excesses, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, other questions? He's like, I'm just making some pasta, and then I got a phone yeah. call. I like like a quarter in the jukebox, <laughs> just being like Murakami. <laughs> I think he's amazing, and that's a wonderful kind of counterexample, right? So you sort of just you are sort of like the, the goldfish in like the little baggie, kind of like acclimating to the water or something, you know? I, I, he gives you some time um, and then something, yeah, like a cat will stride in or, I don't know, if you're like a wife in a Murakami story, don't get on the elevator. <laughs> that won't end well. <laughs> Take the stairs, lady. Um, yeah, I don't know, I mean, I, but I think that's a good point that actually there is no one way to sort of introduce something insane. Um, I think there though, the, the, the through line is just the tonal consistency, right? So he's not really, it's not like suddenly it's in all caps or you know, suddenly we're making some giant shift uh, tonally. There's, you're sort of merged with this consciousness that's letting you, I, th I, I mean, I, that's a very kind of clumsy answer, but I think for me, that's the pleasure of that sort of the slow, the gradual slide into an alternate space is you've had a chance to kind of experience this consciousness in its own, you know, mundane or ordinary reality. Um, and then, so it's, and, you, and you sort of trust that narrator in some sense, right? Like you're sort of like, well, you are such a good writer and in this same register that you're telling me about, like the pasta boy, like you're telling me about, I don't know, like a bottomless well. <laughs> and you, and um, it's just that the quality of the writing is, is um, feels true to that. Its origins feel true, I guess, right? Like that consciousness feels like a well-ordered place that you know and that is consistent. And so then when things start to kind of like slip around and go awry, you are rooted in one specific personality. <laughs> um, but I love Murakami too. Yeah. I think we have time for two or three more, maybe. Um, yeah. Oh my goodness! What a sad, what a sad answer I will now give. <laughs> I was like, uh, impossibly, like once upon a time, I was like 22 and in this graduate workshop. And I wrote a story that to me felt like Tolstoy length. I think it was like 30 pages. And I was like, this is a novel and I will finish in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, just like, 
no, not at all. I know, I think I, I think I started spending on credit cards just thinking that I would, I don't know. Um, it took a really long time and I can't recommend that to anybody as a way to write a novel actually, to take like a short story and like, I just felt like playing the accordion badly for a long time. And it took really something like off and on like five or six years before that book was published. And um, I think I thought that I was starting f at a real ad advantage space because I felt like I knew that world, which was basically like my backyard in South Florida. And um, I also had this idea as like a story writer, you know, it's a different, I was like, oh, well, like a novel, you can be kind of endlessly digressive. And, and it turns out that's not. <laughs> Who knew, but that's not really true. Um, so I, I, yeah, it took, it took a really long time, I think. I don't know if this is encouraging or discouraging to everyone, but I remember like the first draft that I turned into an editor, there was one thing circled that like the editor thought was good. <laughs> and it was that I compared a stick of butter to a little fang, like a melted stick of butter. And she was like, ha ha, and that was it. So. <laughs> If any of you are in, in like the valley of the shadow, I just offer you that as like, I mean, this was like a 500 page draft and there was one thing circled. So, um, I think that if you, in like a, yeah, if you have whatever terrible brain ailment is making you do this and you find that you can't like leave your draft to go into the sun with friends, the consolation I can offer you is that it, it might end. <laughs> so that's my pep talk for this evening. <laughs> should we end with a pep talk or? I know. I mean, more time for more questions. Should go. Just look a hand back there. <laughs> Were you guys all able to hear the question okay too? Oh, so the, oh, it's okay. The question's also um, about language and being, um, I think, taking the, uh, navigating unfamiliar and familiar, familiar language and maybe strategies and techniques where you are paying more attention to um, and pulling, playing with the language. Yeah, I like the part of that question that was just a compliment. I wanna leap up like a dog. <laughs> Leave up like a dog catching a frisbee and just take the compliment. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think that some of my favorite writers, um, thank you so much, I, that's a, that's, that, I'm glad that it reads that way. I really think some of the people that I was influenced by, we were talking about Alexander Kamon a little bit before, and he's someone who writes in English as a second language and has this like, just almost teoretic metaphoric brilliance. Um, and I, I, you know, I think the pleasure of um, that kind of capture of reality that like shifts you enough that you can see something so ordinary for the astonishment that it is. I, I, I envy the poets. I feel like that's their special skill set, you know? But um, I don't know how to do it. I have no idea how to do it. I just think reading omnivorously and looking looking at these other people you admire and sort of getting into that headspace. It's a little bit like child's eye, I think, right? Like you're just seeing freshly, or f foreigner's eye. The Heyman example that just came to me, he has, I don't know if you, in the question of Bruno, mm -hmm. it's just such a little thing, but he's describing an elderly couple and he says that their hands, they're holding their hands like this, look like frogs humping. <laughs> and like, I've never seen hands doing this sense without thinking of that, you know? <laughs> And um, it's nothing, and who even notices when people do that, you know? And just the idea of like this, the hilarity too of like some long-standing monogamous, like liver-spotted couple being like, yeah, frog something. I just, all, <laughs> all of it was so pleasurable to me. And that is a deep pleasure, right? To kind of get knocked out of your, yeah, just the, the glare of noonday and sort of be able to see things again. Um, but I think, I don't know how to do it. I just think reading people who do it well, reading poets especially,
and kind of get, get you back into that space. I had a question for you that was around that same topic, though, because I think you do do it so well, and you have so many inventive words and adjectives, too, but you also strike a balance where it, then you can see it used in a really recognizable and familiar way, um, so that it's so it's both pleasurable to encounter something new and then to um, find the familiar in it as well. I hope so. I hope so. It's a tough balance, right? I was reading some Gertrude Stein, and I love her, and then I, occasionally I'm like, oh, I think I've... I think I've got to paddle back to shore now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I am. Picasso, over here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tender buttons. <laughs> it's kind of like really messy jazz is how someone described it to me when I was yeah. trying to read her out loud. Just like music rearranged. Yes. Where, yeah, at a certain point you're like, what does my name mean? I guess I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, well, time to paddle back to shore. <laughs> um, I don't see anyone giving me a time stop, so I'm going to go with another question. <laughs> You strongly agree, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Got to agree with you. Um, but I think that might be maybe in some alter. I, some of my favorite writers, Rivka Galchen has a book called Little Labors, and um, Maggie Nelson, The Argonauts, which is amazing. I just feel sort of muted by that experience. I feel like language couldn't help me much. <laughs> with the, just felt like clumsy salad tongs to understand what was happening was language at that time. Um, so I don't know, but I do think that that was a very humbling thing, you know, um, and I think that the wordless place that that exists, I mean, I, yeah, I, I feel still pretty tongue-tied and muted, and I'm glad that other people can approach that in language, and I f feel like a little hesitant, but I think like, and I'm sure Diana, as a fiction writer, feels the same way, right? Like, hey, maybe you'll bank the shot, and it'll just show up in some other in some other way, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, that is truly unnerving that that's how we all got here. I do sort of wander around now and I'll see these really arrogant looking men on their cell phones in business suits and I'll be like, you have a belly button, my sir. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget. <laughs> um, yeah, back there, in the blue. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, and I mean that in a good way. I totally, totally love the reaction, but I, I feel that is also a better question. It's like, where, where, where does it come from? And a little bit like a linked question is all the things that you could write about, but as you as a creative person, you want to sort of do your editing to the side. How do you choose that I'm going to write about that? Oh, man. I always feel like the lazy answer is just Florida. <laughs> like, I don't know, probably Florida. Um, but I do think there's this way. I grew up in in South Miami, and I talked a lot about the fantastical that is so real and so real it is fantastic, and that's like a lot of that really is just, um, just Miami. I don't know if you guys have been down there. It's a really insane place, but there's no way to know that until you leave Miami. Um, and the peninsula is so long that maybe you never do until you're like 18. So I think, um, yeah, I think yeah. that's connected to your question about like, yeah, adolescence and such a sort of like, kind of hot boxed into Florida. I don't know, mm -hmm. guys. Um, and Sleep Donation, too, the insomnia descriptions were also like terrifying, and I, I think you'd written about sleeplessness as well, too, so it seems like another kind of yeah. fear, the fear of, or obsessions or whatever that come with us from Kansas into Oz, to things that inspire stories. And it's, but that it's, that it's interesting to see things that occur, right? I don't know if you guys have had this happen, but I do find that just like kind of fascinating, like what you remember from certain stories and what you're drawn to. And then in the stories you write images that recur in the way that you feel sort of helpless against. And you mentioned like sleep, sleep stuff. <laughs> um, that's definitely one. Um, I think it's just really humbling and scary a little bit because so you're writing, yeah, the blank page is there and you have total freedom. You can write anything that you want into existence. 
and yet I do find that some of the writers I love the most, and definitely I feel this too, the, the older I get, you start to see patterns, right? You start to see, you think you're writing something totally new, and then it's sort of like that B-horror movie where the cab driver turns around and you're like, not you again. <laughs> like, oh no, I thought we were getting out of here. It's that, it's that same asshole. <laughs> I mean, you do start to discover your preoccupations, right? So I don't, um, I was laughing about this recently with Sherman Alexi, where we were like, yeah, you think you're so, so brazen, you're making a big choice, and you're like, I'll make the mother the father now. <laughs> like, that'll fool them. <laughs> um, but I don't know, I feel sort of with, uh, with fiction stuff, Flannery has that great quote that I'm paraphrasing badly about, you really can't control what you can make live. Um, and I know George Saunders, who I really admire, has some quote like that too. He's like, I can do about eight voices well. Um, and people have kind of a different range of what kind of stuff they can make live. Um, but you sort of start to discover that, right? Like, where do you find the outlet? I know Jim Shepard is somebody I really love. And he has talked about, he'll draw a Venn diagram and he's like, Nazi Yeti hunter, you know, French executioner, Jim Shepard, father. And like, where is the Venn? <laughs> so... <laughs> And I do think there's something to that, right? It's like, what, what kinds of people or monsters or characters can you, can you find that then overlap with? Um, that's not a great answer, but I, yeah, so I guess the show, I really don't, don't know why I'm drawn to these strange adolescents or adults that just, I remember I was trying to write just like a regular adult woman and Brad Morrow, who's this editor at the Fabulous Literary Journal Conjunctions, I was like, telling him I was having a hard time and he's like, why don't you give her a brain tumor? Or wings. <laughs> so it's, yeah, you can't really control who you can imagine into, I guess, is the short answer. Mm -hmm. um, I think Florida has something to do with it, though, definitely. And growing up there, you said there was also like an outsider perspective, too. So, you know. Yeah. You know, I, I guess I'm thinking about perspective a lot and the architect who engineers these structures too and what kind of how that shifts. Who's the right? native and mm -hmm. who's sort of the yeah, yeah. who's what where, where you're positioned in that space. Yeah. Definitely. I don't know a ton of writers that I would say feel absolutely comfortable in their own skin, you know? Um, but one of the one of the kind of silver linings of that um, is that people become really observant um, too. Mm -hmm. Or you, or that's the hope I guess. So do one more question. Um, yeah, from the front row. The question is sort of how you discover your moments in writing and also how you work with editors to help you to that moment. Just so everyone can hear it too. So the writing process from the germ of the story to how you develop and write the story later on. Yeah, I always feel like such a champ talking about process, nice guy in the front, because I would never wish what I do on any other person. Like, <laughs> I'm always hopeful somebody will do like the Goodwill Hunting equation on the board, or and they'll be like, oh, I'll do it that way. And actually, any other interview I read, I just I'm like, oh, that's the way. I read Jenny Egan in some interview says that she writes longhand, and I was like, cool, <laughs> I'll do that. Um, like I, I'm. It's a demented process, I think. Um, but I think that the, I've gotten into the worst troubles as a writer when I too soon will decide what kind of story it is, you know? I think that's the worst trouble that I've ever gotten into is sort of like in a very early stage or kind of I'll preempt certain directions the story might go because I'll decide I know what I'm doing, which is never true, never, never true. So I'll think, you know, uh, oh, I don't know, you know, like this is going to be a, a reflection on monogamy or something. You know, you, you have these C-plus English major ideas about what you're doing, <laughs> and then it's like all of the life goes out of something. I really think stories are smarter than people on this level, you know, where it's like you might have this really embarrassing, poor ambition for what you're doing, and if the story works at all, you're going to give it the freedom to kind of spiral out or like go down some corridor, and you'll discover, too, what it is you're really writing. I love... 
I know I've talked about Flannery a lot, but she has that quote about how the paragraph, there's a story, you know, Good Country People, where this Bible salesman steals a girl's wooden leg. Like a wooden leg could feel a little heavy handed as a symbol, right? But she talks about how she was just thinking that it had literal, you know, significance in the plot of the story and that she was surprised herself when, you know, white space, new paragraph, this dude stole the leg. And I really think, I think there's something to that. Like to, if it feels messy and you don't know what you're doing, I think that can be a pretty good place. It's uncomfortable, but I think if you can, if you can stay there and sort of stay with the language and discover what your preoccupations are instead of imposing too soon some kind of like lame thesis about what you're doing. Cause I, that, I, that's how I'll kill a story. I'll be like, aha, an op-ed about medical apartheid, <laughs> you know? And then it's like dead. <laughs> um, so it'll, I think the best, the stuff that I'm, I'm happiest with, it's usually, I was surprised too by what it became. Um, or it just became something in excess of what I had imagined. So uh, that uh, Silkworm Girl story, I got really excited about that because I was like, oh, thank Christ, there's a structure I can recognize. This is going to be a story of a stalled metamorphosis, but I can borrow from nature a structure. And, and that did sort of help me. But then there's like a weird, this, this, this kind of, it was uncomfortable, right? But it felt like something that had lived inside of other stories migrated to this one, and um, this particular character, the nature of her regret felt familiar to me from other stories. So it was sort of that B-horror movie where I was like, you again, why are you here? <laughs> but that was sort of what I plugged into to give life to this, this imagine, uh, this realm that I didn't really know, you know? So this is like a crazy answer. But, um, but I think that that was, and it feels like a like a grace when that happens or mercy. Like I have so I have plenty of like dead in the water drafts where, for however much I I love the, like the idea or the concept, I never found a way to plug into that that thing right that genuine question or that genuine preoccupation. I never found the Jim Shepard then. Um, so that's all to say, and I I do find that there's something heartening in that if you're feeling sort of. A little bit, a little bit uncertain yourself about where a draft is going. That's just not a bad place to live, I think. Yeah. And if you're interested, a reader will be interested. That's the other. That's the other thing.